there are spirits everywhere, watching, waiting, seeking that opportune time to reveal themselves like no other. They fill our worlds with so much. Seriously? You didn't just do that. You farted on the promo? What's wrong with you? I thought you were a professional. Go away. Go. I, I got it. I got it. Hey, everybody. It's Brian Bowden, host of Nobo Boomy, where we explore deep inside the Goblin universe. We have an amazing show that covers the paranormal, conspiracies, music, art, entertainment, trending topics, and so much more. Please join us by subscribing to the show on Podbean at InsideTheGoblinUniverse.Podbean.com, on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and everywhere you find podcasts. It's an informative, fun, and overall entertaining good time. And uh, we'll keep the gas to ourselves. Why don't you burp next time? Someone give me Brian Anderson. Welcome to Paranormal Heart, a place where people can talk about their paranormal experiences. With your host, Cat Ward. Welcome back, folks, to Paranormal Heart. I'm your host, Kat Ward. You can find new episodes on the second and last Sunday of each month on Podbean, YouTube, New Lantern Media, and any place you find fine podcasts. If you've had paranormal encounters you'd like to share, you can either be a guest on the show, or you can submit them in writing, and I'll be more than happy to narrate your story. So just drop me an email at paranormalheart13 at gmail.com. Here in Canada, it's Mother's Day, so this episode shout out goes to all you beautiful mothers out there, not just in Canada, but all around the world. Happy, happy Mother's Day. In episode 59, my special guest is Bama Murdoch. He's an avid hiker and camper and was raised hunting, fishing and trapping. His real interest in Sasquatch began after having what he believes to be several encounters with something at a long time hunting camp at Land Between the Lakes, or LBL. Bama is also a very well-known member of the Beast Group, which is a group of Bigfoot researchers around the LBL area. I give to you, Bama Murdoch. Hello, Bama. Welcome to Paranormal Heart. How are you doing, Kat? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm great. We're, we're fresh back from LBL, Land Between the Lakes, so, yep. you know. The moose I, has crashed out over there, and I'm, I've recovered, though. I'm all organized. Again. Good. Yeah. Moose all tuckered out from uh, last weekend still? <laughs> he is. If we take him on a real outing like that, for people that don't know, Moose is uh, a dog that I've had since about six months old. He's probably about six and a half or seven now. And uh, so he has just, his life has been in the woods and camping and kayaking he's thrown in and out of boats and uh you know, out in the middle of the night boogering and stuff like that so uh but he'll come home and crash out for two or three days oh and, wow uh, sleep which is great yeah <clears throat> you uh you're gonna have to start your own show the bama and moose show <laughs> i don't think so <laughs> <laughs> i feel for y'all uh because like your show <clears throat> has some great content on it uh it can't be easy putting a show together and and i'm with a, a group of people i'm actually uh i run with the beast group and that's uh uh the people that i i would we that's kind of the people i investigate with but uh <clears throat> they have a pretty good show and i kind of know all the things that goes into 
putting that show together so y'all can kind of have that i'll stick with posting <laughs> my little videos and uh and you know taking pictures of flowers and things for y'all <laughs> like that i like your pictures yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is actually the first time we've spoken so this is pretty cool we've yeah, been in the chat right. and on uh mark and larry's show and yeah, we, yeah. you and I texted a little bit when even when I was up at LBL. Yep. Uh, and I told people we were sitting around the fire, gosh, with a with a bunch of people, more than went to our original meet and greet. Uh, and I told them that you were texting me, and gosh, yeah, I mean, you know, everybody there knew you, so. Oh, really? But yeah, that, yeah, they did. <laughs> a oh, lot that's of pretty us, cool. I mean, gosh, ninety something percent of the people there. You know know you when they mention your name so oh wow uh, but yeah we had a great time up there had some good things going up there too we usually do yeah i really hope after this COVID thing is, is done to be able to get down there um it's such an interesting place and you guys are there a lot it i live relatively close to it i mean <clears throat> i really didn't even know of land between the lakes we call it lbl and i'm yep. sure there's lots of your people that have been there they've heard stories about it uh but i was relatively close to it uh and i worked uh here for gosh a little over 20 years and uh it was close to me but i worked with a guy who bow hunted up there a lot but he never really talked about that much because I have lots of friends that hunt mm -hmm. he retired several years before me and I'd say cat somewhere maybe around 2011 or so he said uh, you know man why don't you get into to bow hunt so that's really what got me up to land between the lakes I hate to kind of go off on a story about that but if anybody has heard of it or uh, I just want to kind of give you a little a brief overview of it because yes, this please. is where a lot of my th things happen at. Uh, but I started going up there. If you look at the state of Tennessee, up in the middle, on the top, there's a notch up there. Well, land between the lakes starts in Tennessee, little town called Dover down there, and there's a road called the Trace. And the trace runs from south up to north, up into Kentucky. And it runs right up the middle of land between the lakes, which is not a national park. It's, it's classified as a national recreation area. Hmm. And what's interesting, the reason it's called that is because if you look at it on the map, there's two giant bodies of water, one on each side. One side's Lake Barkley, and by a giant body of water, I'm saying, you know, it, some places it could be half a mile across mm. there. You know, big barges come through there. Oh, wow. <clears throat> you know, so it's, you know, big enough water to work. There can be giant white caps and waves out there. And then on the other side is a, the Cumberland River or Tennessee River side. And if you start at the south, and you just start driving up through there and i've had several people do this that have uh that have made that trip with me it seems like you drive forever and and a lot of people ask me are we still in the lbl yes <laughs> because it just you know, goes on forever <clears throat> excuse me let me get a drink here sure. <clears throat> and otherwise it's just kind of like little dirt roads that you know go off here there and yonder well i followed him up there and just to give you an idea of the the location and this this is really what started me on the whole deal and this this is really why i'm on your show right now i followed him up there and we went up to trace and we turned off onto a dirt road and we went out there seven or eight miles just out of road and it was such deep lush there was places where it was downright gloomy because the canopy being over you on this little dirt road that 
you could look at some places and tell there had been cars through there and there's in days, you know. Mm. Uh, and we went way off back in there and we turned off on a road that I found out was a cemetery road. And the thing about land between the lakes is, is it's, it used to be covered with lots of homesteads and, <clears throat> you know, people living there years ago. And before they came along and kind of dammed a lot of that, flooded it, the, the government decided to take that land to do that. So those homesteaders had to leave. But their cemeteries are still there. And I'm sure there's some of you that may even know the exact number of cemeteries. But there's hundreds. And there's no telling how many, we talked about this, how many are unmarked. Uh, I've turkey hunted there and had the sun come up and me be sitting in the sinkhole of a grave of a no. cemetery that I didn't even know existed. Wow. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's so, kind of creepy. But we turned off this road and we went out and there's a little cemetery that was uh, that was mowed and people keep it decorated. You know, where I'm from in the south, once a year you have decoration day mm -hmm. and that's when you go and you clean up your cemetery and everybody shows up and you eat and uh, you throw away the old artificial flowers and put up new artificial flowers you know so it's kind of like that well you drive on past that little cemetery maybe a good four or five hundred yards and it dead ends right into the water beautiful i mean I can remember driving down in there and just thinking, good Lord, I thought, I mean, we're really, you know, we're off in here. I mean, we're pretty remote in here. I always joke that, you know, when you can't get a phone signal nowadays, you're remote. Yeah. So we, <laughs> we were way beyond that. Uh, there was one spot up at that cemetery where you could send a text, though. <clears throat> and it's funny because there's times that and you'll understand why there's times later on that I was afraid to go up to that cemetery if, if I if I were camping to send a text at night so I'd go go up there and text before it got dark but I got down there and we we camped there for years and we'd stay for days at a time hunted fished we used to have a little boat with a trolling motor and we'd kind of putter around out there in that little boat well, I'm sorry to go so long on that, but I'm just kind of no, setting, <laughs> setting me up here. Yeah. There's a, we had probably camped there the equivalent of months by the time uh, we were camping this one particular time. And it was about 1030 at night and the weather's warm. Uh, but at night it was getting pretty cool. But so, And that's when we liked to camp, when the weather was 80s in the day and it was cool at night. And we always made the joke that that uh, you know it was good to it was good to hunker down during the day and then go out and do your fishing and stuff at night. So that's kind of what we planned on doing. So we're kind of sitting around the fire there, and I had a fire built. For some reason, we decided, man, we ain't gonna get out there and go fishing. And it, we're it's about ten thirty at night. And if you can picture this. Kind of our backs to the water because you kind of want to sip the smoke ain't hitting you in the face. So we ended up having our backs to the water. Mm. Off to the right of me was a little cove that ran up, up into, it kind of a little finger cove that ran up into the woods there. Well, I heard a splash and the splash was big enough to, I mean, it, it immediately caught my attention. Uh, my buddy is quite a bit older than me uh that's pure great but when that first splash hit i literally said the words out loud big splash that's what i say because we would say that a lot of times we heard a big fish or something splash mm -hmm. so they go big splash and that's what i did gosh it wasn't 45 seconds later well there was another big splash now when i describe this if you can imagine you standing on a on a creek bank or a river bank and you just pick up a big old rock 
and you throw that thing out into the water where it's deeper. Mm -hmm. And you know how when a rock goes into the water, it sucks down and you get that kush so yep. you know that it's that deep water that the, wa that the rock's going into. That's the reason this was catching my attention. Because that water over there is pretty dang shallow. I mean, we can't, couldn't even take our little John boat up in there. Uh, but it caught my attention. And after maybe about the fourth time, I just looked at my buddy and I said, don't you hear that? I mean, can't you hear that? And he goes, <clears throat> man, I don't hear anything. And I said, those splashes. I said, man, those are big splashes. And he goes, man, and he, and this is true. He goes, man, there's stuff splashes around here all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's true. That's what I tell people. If you're at LBL at night, there's stuff splashing. And if you've got a full moon, there's birds screaming at each other, for goodness <laughs> sake. So, but I was conditioned to all this over the years of camping here. So this was something new. Mm -hmm. Moose had been going there since he's probably six months old. I took him in there when he was tiny. So, man, after about maybe the fourth splash, he had, you know, got his head up out from under his blankie, you know, <laughs> on his camping chair there. <laughs> <laughs> he has his own camping chair. I love it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, otherwise, he'd be in my lap. But he kind of got to look in that way. But the thing that got me was when his nose went up and he started kind of scenting the air a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now, I've had the opportunity to handle service dogs and help train dogs over a lot of a career. Uh, I've always seen them as, as, I love animals and I love moose to death. Uh, the service dogs, I understood what a tool they were when I handled them. So really when I got moose he's a little rescue dog uh my intention was to have something to go camping hiking something to just you know not just companionship but <clears throat> you know they make it a good alarm and he's a good yep. anybody's camp with him can tell you that he's a pr pretty good camp dog but he was starting to act a little hinky so i finally just thought man i'm going to ease down there and see if I can, you know, maybe get a little closer to what this noise is. And the reason that you could drive right past this campsite and down to the water is it appeared as if there was an old boat ramp there at one time. So that boat ramp kind of stuck out into the water. And that's where we would, you know, put our little John boat out there. And you had to go way out before you even would get to waist deep out there cat i mean it's very shallow but i thought i'm gonna sneak down in this boat ramp and i had a little spotlight at the time that we would uh, watch our jugs with when we were jug fishing so we could see them out there i thought i'm gonna sneak down in this thing and i knew i wasn't gonna be able to really see maybe what was making the noise but i thought at least I can see where the waves are coming from. When I hear the next splash, I'm going to throw the spotlight up, and I'm going to be able to see the waves moving away from it. <clears throat> and I'm going to try to pin this. This is the way my mind works, and this is what has brought me over this many years to this point. This is what I'm t telling people. This is what I'm thinking. So I'm going to figure out at least where it's coming from. Well, I sat there and kind of had squatted down behind some of the, this, you know, grown up junk there. And there came the last splash. And I threw that spotlight up across that water. Well, I told you it was warm in the day, cool at night. Well, that water was warm. And with it being cool at night, it threw up maybe about four or five inches of fog across or a mist across the top of that water where you couldn't see a wave you couldn't see anything well the second i threw through the spotlight up i realized that never got another you know splash never got anything <clears throat> by the time i got walked back up my buddy had one of those uh 
truck campers that you where you sleep over the cab, you know, an on top mm-hmm. truck camper. So he was already in there, you know, rattling around and banging around, going to bed. And I hung out there maybe another thirty minutes or an hour, sitting around the fire. And every once in a while, Moose, he, he, he's got the biggest parabolic ears you've ever seen. <laughs> uh, but he'd throw that head up as if he were hearing something way off over there. I keep going back to this point. We've camped here a bunch. Mm-hmm. And my buddy has camped there <clears throat> years before I have. Uh, in fact, there's there's times when he's told me he doesn't even build a fire he would just literally sit outside in the dark in a chair with a headlamp and read a book that's just you know me i have to have a fire but you know so i'm saying that we're both comfortable here you know know, what's going to happen well i guess it was oh goodness gracious it was probably about maybe eight months later. I think we kind of waited to go through the hot part of the year before we went back. And my buddy had hurt his back. But in the meantime, while he was laid up, and this is the truth, he's laid up. I guess he got on eBay and got to looking around. And he bought a small pontoon houseboat because all the years we've been camping there, all we would talk about was, man, if we had a pontoon houseboat, <laughs> yep. we we could go across the bay to the old campsite where he used to camp that's mysteriously got shut down and, and closed off. Hmm. We could go up there and camp out. Now, it's two of us that worked together for years and think about this. We're talking about we can camp out under the stars and just, you know, we just wanted to relax. Man, he got a hold of a houseboat somewhere, this pontoon houseboat. And I can't even remember how long it took him to get that thing down from Kentucky down into Tennessee, but I met him. So, we get that thing set up, and we go across the... I actually went to my old our old campsite, and when he showed up, I just kind of, you know, threw some stuff on that little boat and across there we went. So if you can imagine, when we get to the other side, I actually waded water about waist high, or no, excuse me, about chest high, and all my stuff was in one of those big plastic totes. He was going to stay in the houseboat, which had air conditioning and a shower and all that stuff. Nice. Now, this ain't fancy. This is not a fancy deal by any means but uh, but I did when I got over there I found a little spot where the water washed down uh, some gravel and I just kind of threw my tent up there because otherwise it was a jungle I mean the campsite didn't even exist anymore well man you know me I'm kind of OCD so I got my stuff all set up did my wading back, back and forth across there and uh, he cut out fishing on his on a little kayak he brought that he drug down there behind that houseboat. So I took old moose and I <laughs> threw him under my arm and I climbed up this ladder on the back of the houseboat. Now I've had dogs that would climb a ladder. You could just tell them to, and they would just climb a ladder. Uh, and in a lot of competitions. They require your dog to climb a ladder. Moose ain't climbing a ladder. <laughs> so I got him under my arm and I took him up there and just kind of threw him up onto the top of this little, this little houseboat. I threw me a little chair up there and it's one of those boat chairs <laughs> with little <laughs> stumpy legs on it. Yeah. Uh, you know, so if, you, so if you're in waves, you know, you don't flip over. But, you know, it's funny, <laughs> you know, sitting in one of those little stumpy chairs. So I had that up there and a life jacket and I threw that life jacket down and Moose laid up on that life jacket and it was just starting to get dark and when I explained to people how dark this is what it looked like the water was so dang smooth it looked like glass and we had set that boat up to where it faced the west and I was looking 
at a sunset that had gone down behind the trees and just LBL has beautiful sunset and I was sitting there and if you were to look up into the woods it was just dark enough to where you couldn't see up into the woods you were just looking at, at, at black but if you were to look out across that water up at the sky you know there's you know, plenty of light there well man we just got settled in and something up on the hill directly behind me and I'm gonna estimate oh gosh I'm gonna say it was maybe 200 yards just screamed its dang head off at me <clears throat> well when it did it the first time I mean it really it it shook me because everything was so quiet and not dead quiet but everything was so normal and quiet up to that point and when this thing screamed, I mean, it, it really shook me. And I literally grabbed the, I grabbed the arms of that, that, <laughs> that little stumpy chair. <laughs> I grabbed the arms of that chair. Moose never made a noise. Uh, he's pretty good about it. If he sees something, he'll make a noise. If, if you're camping and he makes a noise, you should probably start looking or get out of your chair mm -hmm. <clears throat> or something. But he didn't make a noise. He just turned his head around and was looking up the hill and his ears up and I kind of sat there for a minute and it's almost like if somebody you're driving down the road and somebody pulls out in front of you, you know how it kind of shocks your system yeah. <laughs> well I'd kind of you know calm down for a second <clears throat> well maybe about that time I thought I'm going to go down and get my cell phone now, do I leave Moose up here? If if I do go down the ladder, is he going to try to follow me? Is he going to leap off into the water? I'm thinking these things. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, man, can I go get my cell phone just to record this? Because I'd like to go get it to take some pictures and stuff anyway, if you want to know the truth of the sunset. About the time I started getting my butt up out of that seat, this thing screamed at me again. It, it sounded exactly the same. The pitch of it was the same, the length of it was the same, and it came from exactly the same area. The only difference was, is the second it started, I kind of, you know, I was ready for it this time. Mm -hmm. So I really, man, I tuned my ears into it. So I got to hear it from, from the start to the finish. And when it was over, I heard it even, n not an echo, but you, you know how sound travels up through hollows and through the woods. I could hear the sound as it traveled up a little, you know, a little finger hollow there that I've turkey hunted, <clears throat> which is an old cemetery road that they, uh, you know, that they've made, which is impassable now. Mm -hmm. But that's where that was at. Well, I just thought, man, I thought, gosh, I got to get out and get my phone. But by this time, I'm just thinking, well, Moose, you're just going to have to, you know, you're going to be smart enough to sit up here by yourself. Uh, and I got up and I told I told people I was afraid to I was afraid to stand straight up uh, for some reason I just I just had that feeling I just so I kind of melted out of that chair just kind of oozed out of it onto the like, <laughs> I tell people that, that I was sitting there and it was like I just I thought I'm just going to make myself like liquid, just just kind of <laughs> go across the top of this boat. Man, I'm going down there and get my shot. Well, as soon as I started to move, well, that's when the next scream came. There's a total of five screams that this thing did. And I just, I didn't really think I was stuck up there, but I just thought it was very coincidental that every time I decided to move, that, that you know, this scream came. When the last one came, uh, gosh within literally within two seconds of the last screen and it echoing up into that little uh, hollow again off to my left and if you can picture this I picture y'all doing this in the woods it sounded like something had picked up a stick or a pretty good size something off the ground that was rotten <clears throat> and had whacked that against a tree Cause that makes a difference you don't get that babe roof you know yeah. home run you know sound this was a a very clear rotten 
I don't want to say tree knock, but that's that's what it was. I mean, that's what it sounded like. But I heard it hit the tree, break, and you could almost hear that two or three times as it kind of spun through the air. And it, I heard it when it hit the ground, the piece. And I looked at that and I just thought, gosh, I thought, whatever that is. I really thought, thought maybe somebody's messing with me. I don't have really anything along the lines of Bigfoot on the on the brain at this mm-hmm. point. <clears throat> but when I heard that, I thought maybe there is another little camping spot in there. You know, maybe somebody's in there. Uh, my buddy came around the corner on that little kayak, and I told him to get my phone, which he did, and he handed it to me, and he immediately went downstairs and fired up the generator on that rattle trap of a boat and it was noisy and just and I couldn't hear another thing oh. but <clears throat> this is a tree he told <laughs> he told me he goes man he goes why don't you just he goes man why don't you just get your sleeping bag throw it out on that couch thing over there he goes man sleep in here and we'll just fire up the air conditioner and man across there I waited I took moose <laughs> let him do his business and I came I wasn't I'm not afraid to say I was nervous to sleep over there on that bank. I don't blame you. I know. Uh, We went back across the next day. Uh, I stayed at the old campsite, didn't hear anything, uh, nothing like that. Well, gosh, the next time I came back, and I don't know why I did it, but I came back by myself. Uh, A little maybe a few months had passed and if you want to know the truth we kind of had a falling out a little bit because cat i wanted to go some other place to camp i just <laughs> just maybe every once in a while mm-hmm. uh, and i kind of scouted places and stuff like that because i kind of had i i had a a weird feeling about it that i'd never had before now i'm telling you I've left that campsite at 3.30 in the morning with a tree stand on my back and walk through cemeteries to go hunt. I've done, this is the first time when it kind of, something gave me kind of a weird feeling. Well, I did probably the worst thing you can do, and that was I, I Googled something. <clears throat> and, and I typed in, uh, strange occurrences at LBL or uh, what throws rocks I, I imagine typing that I mean you're looking for the answer so hard that you literally type in what throws rocks into the water at LBL mm-hmm. you know you get kids videos you get, you get all kinds <laughs> of stuff comes up but you really get some some crazy stuff when you start getting into not just you know Sasquatch but you know, dog men and things along that line. Well, and and I'm not psyching myself out, but uh, but I came back alone <sighs> several months later, uh, and I drove down in there. Just everything's the same. But this was a time of year, just like at our meet and greet that time, when the water was down really, really low. So when I drove down to my campsite, the first thing I noticed was the water was down so far. There was, gosh, there's 20, 30 yards of exposed, you know, bank and beach down there. So, of course, when I cut mo- moose loose, he just, you know, I was worried about fish hooks and stuff. And I, I had to let him loose because he cut out just running down through there. And the first thing I thought about was, man, I wonder if I can find those big rocks or whatever was being thrown into the water because the water's down so low now. I mean, mm-hmm. surely I can find these, you know. So, man, I jumped out. Got to walking down through there. And now, when I say the water's right way down, it's hard as concrete, you know, because it's dried in the sun. So, you know, this mud and everything's dried. So, you know, you're not slogging through mud. You're just, you know, walking in dry land. And I look for tracks. You see every kind of natural track there is. I looked for tracks. I couldn't find any where any big rocks had been thrown or anything like that. So I really just 
came back and thought, well, get my tent set up. I literally had dropped the tailgate and reached in. And anybody's camp with me knows I'm a bit of a neurotic. So my stuff is labeled. And it's, it's in <laughs> totes and stuff. And I usually will reach in and grab my shelter tote. And that has all my stuff. From it. I pulled that tote out, set that thing on the ground, <clears throat> and stood up and just kind of looked around. And I just got that feeling that, man, I just, I don't feel like I've, and I've been there before by myself. I mean, don't get me wrong, a bunch of times. I just thought, man, I just don't, I don't feel like I belong here this time for some reason. Uh, and nothing was different other than the water being down. Uh, uh, somebody did ask me this. The only thing that was different, not that it probably makes any difference, but there had been a burn through there. So the woods and all the undergrowth had completely burned on one side of my road that I drive in there on, that little cemetery road. Mm -hmm. So I could look off one side of the road, you could see forever. The other side was just normal jungle. And I just had that, I don't know why I had that feeling that I just didn't belong there. So much so that I packed up, drove, oh God, forever. And I went to a, a campground <laughs> that you pay to stay in. I literally oh, wow. went to to piney campground and a lot of people know where that is and uh, just kind of get me a little primitive spot there well oh goodness i guess it was maybe four or five months later i have no idea i thought man i'm going back i'm just i'm gonna go back there now this is a spot that i had lost a good friend over because i didn't want to camp there anymore mm -hmm. and here i am I'm going back there, uh, you know, for some reason. But I did. Back there I went. This time I got stuck on the way in. I caught it during a rain on the way up because my thinking was, man, I sure don't want to catch nobody at my camp spot. And, uh, and if I go up during the rain, there won't be anybody there because I can see where other people camp there. So I got stuck for a little while. Finally got down in there and got set up and it was, that rain made it so cool that I had put on a pretty heavy jacket and there was a mist out there enough to where I couldn't hardly get a, a good a good fire going. But once again, everything always seemed to happen around 10, 30, 11, 11, 30. Once again, about 10, 30, sitting there in that camp chair and I had found a big wooden pallet up in the woods so i finally got that thing burning so i had a little bit of a fire and moose in his camp chair next to him covered up and about 10 30 at night directly across the campfire if you can picture yourself sitting in a chair i mean looking right across the top of the flames mm -hmm. is the corner of the little camping area where my tent usually is at. In fact, I've never camped there without it being in that corner except this time right now when I was here because my buddy always took the, the spot under the tree with his camper and all that. By 10.30 at night, we're sitting there and everything's completely normal. Nothing went eerily quiet or any of that. And there was a noise that I describe as if you took a big old plastic drum, like one of those big 55 gallon blue plastic drums, that, I don't know, cooking oil comes in or whatever. And if you were to turn that thing over on its side and take an open hand and slap the bottom of that thing, that's exactly what it sounded like. And when it did it, it was such a low percussive noise that it it was a noise that sounded like it, it went out and it came back like it sucked the sound back to it if that if that makes sense to you that's the way it felt to me in my in my chest it was as if something had came out and then boomerang and sucked back there's a really strange feeling and moose lost his dying mind i mean he went from asleep under that uh 
blanket to, I mean, out, you know, out from under. Uh, and he can't, he'll get a little yacked up every once in a while. Uh, but he lost his gourd. <laughs> I'm yelling at him because this wasn't a natural, this wasn't a natural woods noise. This was a, this was a, a noise that, I'm trying to explain this to y'all. This is a noise that you would know as something that was a man-made noise. The sound of something hitting this, if you were sitting there, you would have said, oh, that's somebody hitting their hand on the bottom of a plastic barrel. It really was that clear and that close. And I got him gathered up and uh, I actually got him back setting up my dang lap because I thought if I had to get up and get the truck, I thought, it, you know, at least I can, uh, you know, ca carry him and go get in the truck. And this is the truth. I sat there about another 30 minutes and when the sound happened, it got real quiet. Not, not just because of the sound itself. It just kind of absorbed all the other noises around. But everything got back to normal. And I just had that little twinge of a feeling, nothing overwhelming. But I think it's because I convinced myself that, well, I got stuck on the way in here. I thought I can't get out. And plus, it had rained on me again while I was there. And I just thought, man, if I have to get out of here, uh, it's going to be rough. Not to mention I have to slow to a crawl <laughs> just to get out of here. <laughs> you know, I, I really was thinking, you know, if I have to get out of here, you know, are they going to try to get a hold of my truck? Are they going to crawl up on my truck? Or I mean, I'm not panicking that bad, but this is what happens when you Google stories of LBL, cat. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Well, start thinking of certain scenarios. <laughs> I mean, really. And I went and got my little tent. And I use a different tent now, but I got my little two-man deal. And I actually let the rain fly uh, just just kind of roll back a little bit to where if I laid flat on my belly in there, I could see out the, the crack, you know, uh, of under the tent. I never heard anything. Gosh, I laid there for so long that I finally just, I mean, I just I fell asleep, you know, so I'm in and out of sleep. Man, the next morning I was, you know, packed up and gone. And when I'm driving home, I'm thinking about it. And I remembered a story that my buddy told me while he was there alone one night. Now, we never talked big. One time we talked Bigfoot for just a minute. And we were both of those people that said, look, there literally are tens of millions of trail cameras everywhere. There's got to be pictures of them all over. The place. This was the way our thinking was, or mine at that time. His thinking never got the way mine was. But he was sitting there one night, and I remembered a story he had told me several times. And in order to, I learned that if I said a couple of things, I could get him to tell this story and he really couldn't remember that he had told me the story before. So, one night we're sitting there and I said whatever it is I said and he looked at me and he said, one night I was sitting here in this chair with my headlamp on. He didn't have a fire, sitting there reading with his headlamp on. And he said something just started tearing the woods up. I said, man, well, you know, by this time I'd heard the story a few times, but now I've also heard stories of the beast of LBL and I've heard stories of mock charges and, you know, uh, boogers tearing the woods up and crawling up under your car. So, you know, so as he started that, I said, what do you mean tearing the woods up? And he said, I don't know, just making a whole bunch of racket. And I said, and this was the last time I ever got to ask him this, I said, Describe it in terms of just just by sound. If you were describing it to a, you know, just, I said you were out here in the dark as if you were blind. I said describe it as if you're describing it to a blind person. And he said it sounded like someone was at the top of the hill in a car, 
and the engine was not running and they put it in neutral and they were letting it slowly come down through the woods running over small saplings and cracking trees and stuff along that line and and i said so it it wasn't anything violent he goes no he goes but there was things like cracking like he goes like he said it was like green things cracking to the point to where and this is the first time he said this part he said he actually got it went to the uh to the vehicle and got a little three <laughs> 380 <laughs> pistol out <laughs> and yelled up there get out of here and he said he never never heard anything go never heard anything and it's really the last time he told the story and i know that was a bit lengthy but you know when people ask me how i got into it that really is it i mean there's so many people listening probably that can relate can relate to it because you know, something happened to them you know, logical people, smart, smart, sane people, Captain. <laughs> you know. But that kind of led me to, to, uh, to the Beast Group, and they've been just the nicest people and you know, super accommodating of uh, somebody that asks a lot of questions. And, uh, but then I started going out with them at Land Between the Lakes, and that that has just been that's just an adventure all the time uh as far as it, it, you know if you if you're into bigfoot man then i have probably i have probably been so fortunate enough to hear some things with these people that that not many people you know get to hear it was pretty interesting when you went on the uh, meet and greet and uh you actually found prince that was pretty pretty amazing that was just beyond coincidental and it was dumb luck those were filmed by uh by shelly reed and patrick noble and uh and yeah that was really neat because now look <laughs> we had a really good track way over there of several several prints and I always say, well, it's either a, a, a good hoax or, you know, what we're out here looking for actually made these prints. But, but yeah, when I arrived, somebody took me over there and it was, that really was neat. There's, and me, this is the way I am. Gosh, there were so many people that I thought, man, I wish they were here other than me to see this. You know, people that are, are really really big into it they have done it <laughs> forever you know they never get to see a good good track in in mud much less you know 10 tracks 15 tracks in mud you know so yeah that was that was man that was really something i had gone out with them earlier at, on just a just a few of us camping together and uh you know we really got out doing some stuff at night and got some good vocals but gosh seeing the tracks was you know that's that's just really really something and i literally have one of them right here that that was cast that you know copies were made of of uh, one of the tracks and that was given to us this last time when we were at lb by debbie jones which was pretty awesome yeah if i recall um that first meet and greet, I think Shelly had to go to town to get some plastic because no one came prepared, I think. Am I, am well, I remembering that right? <laughs> this thing had been put off and put off due to COVID. Mm. So when we finally did settle on Halloween, I mean, God, I mean, this really does prove the point of you should probably try to be prepared. <laughs> but what are the chances of right after a hurricane has come through two or three days before that a whole bunch of people that are into bigfoot are going to come from all over the country at one little spot and there's going to be a big giant long trackway running out through a mud flat i mean just it was it really was so ironic that we 
we stood out there and kind of laughed. I mean, we just shook our head. We're like, you know, we, when I first looked at it, I just thought, who has the big giant feet in their vehicle that they're strapping on? You know, not who's stomping around. <laughs> uh, until you just kind of got to looking at it. And I, and then I thought, you know, we may have something pretty significant there, but, but it was, it was exciting to, to, you know, I've had some pretty good excitement in my life. But that was exciting to me because that's a, you know, that was a, a, a new, it, it's almost like it really does prove that, man, if you, if you get out there and, and you're, just you know, good things will happen to you. Like Mark says, you got to get out there and get boots on the ground. What? <laughs> yeah, I was setting up my tent. Somebody else was out there with their boots on the ground. <laughs> you know, that was Shelly and Patrick. That was fantastic. I wish, that, I wish that everybody could have went out there and saw that. I mean, and could have seen those things. You know, on the spot it was really was really the thing pictures the pictures and even the little short kind of little documentary thing we did on it you know it just it doesn't, it doesn't do it justice at all tell us what happened in this uh past i'm going to call it meet and greet too i guess uh that happened last weekend did you hear anything or uh see any tracks or anything well this was <clears throat> we were we were meeting up because it was uh Larry Porch's birthday actually was yesterday, but we were kind of meeting up to celebrate his birthday. You know, just scheduled it where a lot of people could get together. And mm -hmm. gosh, we ended up having a bunch. Uh, still, a lot of this, uh, of course, a lot of the same people. You know, people came from you know Kansas, and Florida, places wow. like that. Uh, uh, I was super excited to. Vicky Fulcher was there, and a lot of people know Vicky's name. She's you know, she's one of the queens, Bigfoot, you know, uh, sis, the Sisters of the Moon were there. A lot of people would know them. Yep. Uh, that was fantastic. I mean, we just had a big time with big food and lots of stuff. Uh, but, of course, you got to go out at night. And there were some people there that had never been out. And it's always fun to take new people. Out. And I'm new. I mean, I'm as I say this, you know, I'm telling everyone, I haven't been out a whole lot, um, but I've been lucky when I have. So, we decided to take a bunch of new people out. Well, the first night, I didn't go. I got there and got set up, and I got a friend of mine that, that had, had uh, that the people in the group, my group know, that had never been camping, so we just were kind of hanging around you know, camp and stuff like that, because, you know, when you're with a beast group, they may be sitting around a fire at midnight and look at each other, look at each other and go, well, let's pile in some vehicles. I mean, and go. That's just that's kind of the way it is. Or it may be 1 a.m. before you ever decide to go anywhere. So that's really what they did. And this is, I really got this account from Debbie Jones. Uh, and she told me this because I didn't know they were going out that night. Uh, she said that they went to a spot that I've spoken about before. And it's a spot where they received 13 howls before as an answer. They were doing wow. calls. Somebody was doing calls at that spot. And they got a total of 13 howls that started way in the distance and came mm -hmm. closer. So. When we talk about that spot, we usually refer to it as a spot of 13 howls. You know, so she goes, well, we went to the, the 13 howl spot. And the last time that I was at LBL, uh, I went, we went to that spot. That was our first spot we, we stopped at and didn't get anything. Now, that's also the spot where I was camping and something stomped bipedally. 12 inches away from the back of my head and my tent that night. Uh, so, you know, this is a pretty, a pretty. And you uh, thought that was Larry that time, right? I did think it was, I did think it was Larry, <laughs> but Larry never came back. That's what I always tell everybody. Uh, I love that part. <laughs> so it's a, yeah, it's a consistently good spot. 
but as far as calls go, it's really hit or miss. I've never heard anything there. But Debbie said they stopped there and uh, and did a call. And I always tell people that uh, just the, the calls can be, it really is probably something that you, if, you, if you're thinking calls about stuff you see on TV, it's probably not, not that accurate. Uh, but man, she said they called there. And I think she said they got a long howl that came back. We get lots of howls in the LBL. And, and, and we're always good. These guys record everything. Uh, they're always real good about putting them on a, a you, know, spec, you know, analyzing them just to see where, where, where the vocals fall at and all mm -hmm. that. Uh, but she said they got a howl back. And I think she said they even got some whoops back there. Now me, I've never heard one. And when she said that, you know, me, I'm like, are, are you sure? And she goes, yeah, we got a couple of whoops back. I think she said they stood there and got howls back. They got a couple of whoops back and it seemed like everything kind of got, it just kind of got ramped up and then that was it. It just turned off and I've, and I've been with them when it was like that, when there's a lot going on and all of a sudden, man, that's it, it's done. So she was telling me about that and I knew that we were going to go out the next night, so we did. And as as usual, first place we went to, we didn't, we didn't hear anything, although that first place was, it was, I don't know why we always end up. Most of the little roads run by cemeteries out in that area, so a lot of times you end up in cemeteries <laughs> <laughs> or around a cemetery. Uh, well, of course, we're on one of those little cemetery roads, and it's just so, so dang dark that I, a lady that, that goes by C.D. Squatcher, if anybody knows her, came up from Florida, and she had my FLIR and was flaring uh, some woods over there because it was so quiet that I was just straining to hear anything, a bug, mm -hmm. anything. And she kept, she kept kind of, I could see the light on the flare moving around and I kind of eased up on her without me knowing, without her knowing I was coming up on her. And she kept saying, I, I keep seeing something. There's something over there. And I was telling her what she didn't know how to do, which she did later, uh, to flip through the different modes on that FLIR. Mm -hmm. really, it was really nice and cool that night. So a couple of those modes worked very well. And the one or two, I like to use a black hot a lot of times. That it was not working well. But we kind of messed around there for a while. And this usually happens, the second spot we went to, we got out, and this is what's odd that, that I tell a lot of people, things can happen to you, supposedly, at LBL, if you're just a few hundred yards off the main road, the trace. And that's what we had done. We had pulled off the trace and had not gone far at all because even though it's 2.30 in the morning, uh, a vehicle came up the trace and I could hear it clearly up through there. Now everybody got out. That, I always say the first spot's kind of like a trial run, especially when you have uh, new people with you. Because, you know, I had people trying to, you know, close doors quietly and get dome lights to turn off in the vehicle, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah. So, the second stop is the second stop. The protocol is a little more smoothed out, so to speak, by the time we got there. But when we pulled up there and got out, Patrick Noble was there also. And the reason I mentioned him is when when we were camping in that campground, uh, he does a good <coughs> owl, a good barred owl, and most people know what a barred owl sounds like. And I always thought I did a pretty good. So me and him are always owling back and forth at each other. And we do the monkey chatter with it when we owl back and forth. And we can get the owls, you know, keyed up. We probably hadn't been out of the truck, maybe. The vehicle's actually maybe 10 minutes. 
And when I tell people that, that's usually so you can, the vehicles pop and they make noises because they're hot as they yeah, cool down. Yeah, cooling down, yeah. Off. They make lots of unnatural, metallic -y type noises. So we're kind of waiting on that to, to calm down and it slowed on down. Well, I was kind of standing close to Patrick and I could tell that because at this spot there was enough opening above us to where oh gosh you could just see the stars so clear and they put out enough ambient light down onto that light colored gravel road that you could look and see the road just run off into the distance as far as you could see at night you could even see that so we're standing out there and we we start we start hearing a bunch of racket over a hill there and if you hear a bunch of owls cutting up and they're a long ways off you don't hear all the notes uh sometimes you'll catch the end notes or something it's kind of like if you're in a car and a siren comes up behind you you're usually just catching parts of whatever your your young ears or your old ears will allow you to catch you know the different frequencies so man these owls are cutting up and I was standing over kind of close to Patrick because I knew he was getting a kick out of it. And they even went into that real monkey chatter uh, over the hill. And as, as usually the second stop will have it directly down that dirt road. And I, I like to look down the roads, especially if I didn't, didn't have my, I didn't have my FLIR. I was looking directly down that road because I'm just always hoping something will run across the road. So I'm naturally just looking down the road. And me and Debbie talked about this the next morning. And me and Larry, Debbie talked about this the next morning. Probably about, oh gosh, it had to be less than 100 yards away. Straight down that road, it sounded like it was standing in the right ditch. That's how close it was. There was the highest pitch whoop. And the second it happened, honestly, I don't know why I thought this, but the second that it happened, the first thing that hit my mind was, I've heard that exact thing on a recording somewhere. Hmm. I've heard someone record that exact same thing. It sounded identical to it. Now, <clears throat> we started batting around. It wasn't barred out. I know that. But we started batting around the idea of maybe it was a screech out. Now this is on this is on someone's audio. This is on probably several people's audio, which we can probably you know listen to later sometime. But it was the it was so high pitched, and when it cut off at the end, it sounded like there literally was the letter P at the end. Really? <laughs> when it cut off. And it was so crisp and loud and high pitched that uh, that I told someone I said that is at the top. That's at the a very high vocal range of a woman. And I'm not speaking about going up into a falsetto. I'm talking about an actual, you know, physical voice. And man, when that thing did that, it really, I mean, it 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 kind of shook me again. And everyone heard it. I mean, whoa, you, you know, people are quiet. <laughs> talk at that time uh, so much so that when we left that spot now oh gosh it's 2 33 o'clock in the morning by this time now these are people that haven't had much sleep in the last two or three days anyway uh, that was so interesting that, that when we left and we were heading back to uh, the, the campground we stayed in Debbie and them actually went back over to that spot just in one vehicle because we had gosh we had probably three vehicles and we had a you know we're just loaded up with people so they actually went back over there to that one spot uh, so they didn't hear a thing not a single thing when they went back <laughs> so they got out there and did calls um, did calls and everything just didn't get a single thing back that's just a you know the way it goes but it it was neat to get one thing you know that happened for the for the trip at least 
they were probably really hoping because you had less vehicles and less people that maybe they'll pick up something else but yeah it's too bad yeah i've been up there with them before when it's just maybe five of us you know six of us which is an ideal uh thing but you know this was this really was meant to be you know just a gathering and uh and that's, and that's the way I always look at it. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get fussy because, you know, 15 people are going out in four vehicles and we don't get to see a Bigfoot run across the road. But that could happen also. Mm -hmm. But it's just, it's just a good time. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, we had a really good time, and I've had great luck at LBL with these particular people because I think that they really know their business. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not really into drama and stuff, and, and uh, they're just they're really nice, you know, nice people. I'm sure a lot of your listeners uh, know the group that I belong to. Oh, probably. Um, I like to make fun of uh, or, or tease Larry and say that the only reason why he likes to go out there is for the food y'all bring. <laughs> because I've seen and heard of some of the food you guys bring. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, we always joke with Larry about that too, but all of us <laughs> like to eat. They joke with me that I don't eat anything. Uh, but yeah, you know, especially this time with it, with it, you know, kind of being so not just celebrating Larry's birthday, but we had a, and I and I am missing someone, and I apologize. But we also had a guy named Mike Williams showed up, and so we had a lot of food, and uh, you know. You normally don't have a truckload of wood delivered, but we had that too, you know, and just nice. so it really was for that. But what a, but man, what a when great you way to celebrate your. Piece. Go ahead. What's that? No, I was gonna say, what a great way to celebrate your birthday, going to LBL with a bunch of people. I know. I mean, I, some people may not think that, but uh, but yeah, and the weather was great. And, uh, you know, it's it. This is before, you know. We've, man, if you're going to LBL, you have you have to get ready for the ticks. Mainly. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. But you know the mosquitoes are bad. But you know we, <clears throat> this is before ticks and stuff. So yeah, it was a, it was a, a lot of fun, a lot of interesting characters there too. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> so what what other experiences have you had? I know that you're talking about uh, some other things that you're going to discuss you know I, you and I talked about this briefly mm -hmm. and I've never told this story out loud to anyone now I, I wrote this down I, I like to write things down but I wrote this down and some people read it but I'd like to tell this last and anybody that knows me kind of if I am known by anybody it's mainly Bigfoot stuff but this is not necessarily Bigfoot related I like to read uh, the missing 411 books I like to watch the shows that, that uh, he has and the reason I like to watch as well because I'm a hunter and I'm a hiker and I'm a camper and I normally do a lot of that alone and that is what a lot of the this uh, the series of books and stuff deal with. Pe that most of your people probably know them better than I do. But for people that don't, this is simply about people that go missing under very specific circumstances, and sometimes they're never ever found. If they are found, they're found under odd circumstances, and sometimes they're found in areas either alive or deceased where that has been searched sometimes a hundred times so it's just very strange for those of you that, that would like to that haven't uh, read it or watched anything about it you know to go look at it but i started kind of getting into that because i've had to deal with missing people in the past now i'm going to tell you this story and i'm going to tell you where it happened and a lot of you, some of you have probably been to this place. And I'm going to explain to you 
where it happened and everything. And I've been back to this spot a few times since then. But here's, here's how it goes. When I'm not camping at LBA or something, and I like to go camping big mountains, as I call them, I go to the Great Smoky Mountains. And I'm not a touristy person, so normally you'll find me around the Nantahala National Forest. Specifically, around a little town called Robbinsville, North Carolina. Now, if any of you ever have ever watched the show on the Discovery Channel called Moonshiners, well, a lot of it's filmed in Robbinsville, North Carolina. Hmm. It's incredibly beautiful and mountainous. And there's, there's clear mountain lakes there. There's rivers that you can camp on. And the main reason I like it is no tourist. No touristy anything. Even if you're going to Robbinsville, North Carolina, that's a small country mountain town with their own country accent type dialect. I thought my Alabama accent was pretty wild sometimes, <laughs> but Robbinsville has a, a different kind of accent. But that's the area where I like to camp and hike and things like that. And this is right off of the Cherahala Skyway, which runs from Teleco Plains, Tennessee, over the mountains into Robbinsville. So I'm giving you an idea of where this area is at. Now at the end of the Cherahala Skyway is a road that goes down to a national forest called the Slip Rock National Forest. Now that's part of the Nantahala National Forest. And this is all part of the Great Smoky Mountains. So I've, I've explained that and got that all layered up for you there. But if you go down in there, most people don't realize that there's an area down there called the Joyce Kilmer Memorial National Forest. And Joyce Kilmer is a man and he was a, a military person and he wrote a poem called the trees and a lot of people have heard the poem the trees well they dedicated this forest to him down there and most people don't know that if you hike into that forest you can see some of the biggest trees in the world other than redwoods hmm. so on this side of the country over on the east coast you can hike in a short hike for free and see some of the biggest trees and probably the biggest trees you'll ever see unless you go somewhere else so that's the reason i like to go to that area now <clears throat> i was down in there camping maybe seven or eight miles away and i'm a radar watcher i like to watch the rains because i just don't like to get wet and uh, I was going to hike into that Joyce Kilman forest that day, but it was coming a, a dang flood. And I'm camping, hunkered down in there. And I got to looking at the radar and I caught a little lull in the rain. And I thought, man, if I can get in there, maybe I got about a two hour, two or three hour uh, gap where it's not going to flood me. And I'm going to hike back in there. And my thinking is always, yes, and nobody will be there either because it's raining. That's my thought. So for anybody that's been there, it really is a dead end. You drive out of, gosh, a beautiful road that's covered with trees with a river next to you, a roaring river, and you park at an actual, you know, a parking lot that has a back, you know, restrooms. Even the parking lot's beautiful. That's what I tell people. Because it really does look like you're in the Pacific Northwest. The way the trees are and the particular trees that are there. And on this day when I drove up in there after that rain, that parking lot was empty. And the trees were all heavy with that rain hanging down and dripping. And it was beautiful up in there. And I thought, I got this all to myself. And the moose is with me, of course. Now this has just been a 
just a few years back. I think I've been back there maybe three times since. But a lot of you remember the forest fires that came through Gatlinburg, and Pigeon Forge, and a lot of the mountains. Well, you don't realize that it burned all of this, a lot of this area too. So as I'm getting my gear ready, and I didn't, I didn't have hiking poles at that time. I just had a hiking stick. As I got to walking up in there, I realized that they had closed one of the trails down. As you walk into Joyce Kilmer, you can either go across a little bridge over the river and take a trail that direction, or you take the right fork and you walk along the river, and the river is to your left. And as you're walking, if you look up to the right, it's a long sloping hill covered with huge boulders and you know lots of boulders up through there. Well, all that had burned, so there really wasn't that much underbrush or stuff up through there. But after all these rains that had eroded and it was really super muddy up on that particular trail, and I had to take that trail. The other trail was closed for some reason. So had to take this trail and this is the reason I'm telling you all this because there was no way for me to be really swift of foot so to speak on this this hike I was really trying to be careful because if I slipped off on my left I was gonna you know go down through rocks and trees and everything that's gonna end up in that river down there but we did me and moose hike back in there gosh and spent a while never saw another person never heard another person never heard anything and we were back in there a while because when you get back in there and you see those trees when you stand at the base of one of those trees you can look up and it just disappears all the way out of sight up into the canopy they're so big i, I posted several pictures of, of those before but now we were coming out and I, we had made the majority of the trip all the way out. And I'm going to estimate that we were probably <clears throat> maybe 400 yards from the parking lot. And I'm taking the same tra trail out, muddy as all get out. But now, if you think about it, the river is on my right. And it's down a steep hill to my right, roaring. I, it's pretty much loud enough to where if you were if somebody was six or seven feet ahead of you, you know, you couldn't speak to them. They wouldn't be able to hear you. <clears throat> well, on the way back out, I'd take a moose off lead, and he, if, if I've got him off lead, he'll normally stay right behind me. He may lag some, but he normally don't get 20 <clears throat> yards or so back. And also, I am very aware when I'm in the mountains of I keep him pretty close because I'm really worried about a big cat, if you want to know the truth. I mean, I'm worried about a mountain lion. Uh, so he's back behind me. And ever since I've had him, and of all the other dogs I've handled, he has a choke. As we were coming out, I'm, you know, I'm walking on ahead, and I'm really trying not to fall down this dang ravine. I stopped hearing his choke chain jingle and i don't Ooh. hear his um hear moose's tags on there jingle and i'm really attuned to these things if he's out in camp somewhere even when there's a whole bunch of people man i can call his name and i will hear that jingle a long ways off just because i'm used to it mm -hmm. you know like people are used to hearing their kids voices so to speak mm -hmm. and i stopped hearing that well i turned around and he was maybe about 25 yards behind me and he had stopped in that muddy slick trail and if you can picture this i was looking at his right side so he had turned to his left and he was looking up that steep hill and there's big boulders up there was a bunch of big boulders up there so much so that you know it seems like the place that, you know kids might climb up in there you know and play and stuff even when they're walking along that trail but what was weird was i kind of he's trained in german i kind of gave him a couple of commands well man he didn't look he didn't it's like 
he didn't even acknowledge me for a second. Well, then I, I started kind of easing towards him, and his head was down at a weird angle. And he's looking up that hill with his ears back, and his head was down. And the thing that really kind of got me was, and people may not understand this, but to me this meant something. His tail was kind of in a neutral position, yeah. and it wasn't look. And the first thing I thought was, oh, man, there's a big cat. I, I thought maybe there's a big cat up there on a rock or something, mm -hmm. or maybe. A, and I thought, I got to get to my dog. Well, gosh, I start kind of walking that way. And I'd never felt this before. I, it's almost kind of like I had a little tingle, like there was a, like there was a, now, I just finished with a big rain. And there's another huge rain that's about to come. And that's why I'm trying to get out of there. I kind of got this little tingle like there was electricity in the air as I'm, as I'm getting towards him. Almost Kind of like if you were out and lightning was going to strike. Or yep. <laughs> so I kind of got that little sensation. But I'm still kind of easing towards him. It just felt like... It felt like somebody just threw a blanket of fear just over the top of me or something. I, that's the only way I can explain it. And I can remember just kind of getting lower and lower to the point where I was kind of like crouched down duck walking with my hand out trying to reach out to get to, you know, Moose's collar. He never, he looked at me one time and turned around and kept looking up there the exact same way. Well, Man, I finally got up there to him, and probably off my right shoulder, oh gosh, maybe 10 yards up was a big rock sitting there. And I, uh, gosh, man, this it's really nerve-wracking even telling the story because I've never even told it in person before. But I reached out almost like with my thumb and my pointer finger to try to kind of get a hold of his collar like that. And for a second, I just thought, man, what in the world is it? There was something in my mind that said, man, it just said, you don't need to look up there. I just, I had that thing to where I just thought, gosh, I just, I can't look up there. I, it's, when I was a kid and we'd watch scary movies, you know how when you as a kid, <laughs> you'd put your hand over your eyes. But if you were still listening to the movie, Sometimes your imagination was worse hearing the noises rather than what you're seeing. I mean, yep. a lot of people relate to that. I kind of had that feeling of if you look up there, it's it's going to be something that I don't know. I don't think it's something that you want to carry around for the rest of your in your head for the rest of your life. Now, how did all that go through my head in such a short? few seconds of time I don't know but this is a feeling of just a, a it's not just panic it's something else now people that's been around me will can attest to the fact that if I tell you that they would take notice to that I'm not a, a, <laughs> not a scared person I just want to get to my dog uh but I remember reaching out and getting his collar, and the second I got a hold of it, it was almost like he kind of snapped out of something. Uh, now, a dog, if you hook a lead to him, I mean, they automatically, they know it, and they become a different uh, dog. But when I reached out, it was like his head came up, and he looked at me, his tail started wagging. And, man, I turned around, and when he went in front of me, I use a lot of sled dog terms and stuff like that with him. And man, I gave him a couple of commands and off he went. And as he was, he never turned around and looked back as we were leaving. But man, as we started, and I had a small camelback backpack on my back. This is just big enough for the water reservoir and a few pockets to put some snacks, some band-aids, you know, bugs, stuff like that. That's the only thing I had on my back. And as we were going out, I can remember this thing going over and over in my mind of, gosh, I was only 400 yards from the, <laughs> I don't know why. 
never told the story before. It's kind of upset for some reason. I just kept thinking, gosh, I'm only 400 yards from the parking lot. I thought, God, it. I thought if I could have only made it. To, I'm, I'm like talking in a past sense in my mind, like, man, if I had only gotten to the parking lot. And as he's going along, I had that walking staff, and I actually kind of, you know, tapped him a couple of times to get him moving. Uh, because I'm bent over, I felt like it, as if I had to keep my head down below my shoulders and 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 walk through there kind of hunched over. It, just, it felt as if there was, you know, something, a, a looming, like a giant looming, you know, over me, uh, which I never felt before. Uh, but man, we got to going down through there, and I just—that's what what got me was when when I thought to myself, "Gosh, I was only 400 yards from the from the uh, parking lot, and this happened, and I didn't know what this was." Uh, but then it felt like if any of you have ever gone to store and bought one of those big containers of bungee straps, all different mm -hmm. sizes, little yeah. skinny ones, big old. <clears throat> It felt like something had hooked one of those really small bungee straps to my back. And it, it almost felt like if I had stood up, I had a big backpack on and I would have fell backwards. It was that little, just that little pull backwards and, and that electricity in the air again. And that's what gave me that feeling of, oh gosh, I'm not, I'm, I'm you know, I don't, I'm not going to make it to the parking lot. I don't know why. I'm not going to make it to the parking lot, but I'm, I'm not going to make it. And I think I I just bared my dang head down and bent over and probably went another, it could have been five yards or 10 yards, and it felt like I was just, it felt like I could breathe again. Mm -hmm. I mean, I literally felt like I could stand up and breathe. And another five or 10 yards, I could hear voices. I could hear people at that parking lot. And of course, when I came down the parking lot, you know, you know, what do you do? Tell, do you say something to people? Yeah, you know, don't go up there. Experience up there. Yeah. Uh, you know, but I did. And a, you know, few cars came in there after that rain. Because I've probably been in there a couple of hours after that initial rain. And right after I left, those two people took a deluge. I mean, they took a huge rain in there. <laughs> so I got to thinking about the, the weather events that were involved with me. Uh, you know, my age, the time of day, traveling with a dog, uh, some of the injuries I've had all fall into a lot of these, you know, missing 411 categories. So I appreciate y'all letting me tell that story because I've never, I've never told the, the story before. Wow. Thank you that, very much for sharing that with us. That was a, that, a, you know, when you're out, when you're out, you know, boogering or bigfooting with, with people, with knowledgeable people, it's way different than, than, you know, being off by yourself and having some, you know, strange like that happen. Yeah. Not that Bigfoot, not that Bigfoot isn't weird enough, you know, <laughs> but, uh, you know, now, during, during the, into some yeah. <laughs> during the rain, was there thunder as well? Like, was it a lightning storm or was it just the, the heavy rain? It was a heavy rain and for anyone that that knows that area there's an area there called the tail of the dragon and the tail of the dragon is a place where motorcycle enthusiasts and sports car enthusiasts they come to ride through the mountains because it's 10 miles there's 300 something curves in 10 miles so I had not camped very far from the tail of the dragon. So as I was driving there, I was driving through rain. Never any thunder, never anything like that. And that's why I was thinking about the tingly, electricity type feeling I was getting. Mm -hmm. uh, that I really didn't have time to think about a lot of this till later. And oddly enough, even when I left, uh, when I made it to the parking lot and you know and was making the drive back to where I was camping at I didn't really didn't think about it a whole I don't know why I just I didn't think about it a whole lot till I sat down uh, and it kind of bugged me as to as to what it was 
you know, I would have, like I said, within the first few seconds, I would have probably thought that I was having an encounter with a mountain lion. Uh, after that, I don't know what it was. I don't have any idea. I do yeah. know that, you know, that the Great Smoky Mountains are one of the, the, the areas where there's the largest concentration of people that have gone missing, you know. Hmm. It almost sounds like you got hit by a wave of uh, infrasound. <laughs> you know what? I, I, you know, if you're in the Bigfoot world, you you hear about infrasound. And we were out one night, and uh, and one of the the guys had done a call, and a yell came down a hill to us, and. Uh, and that hit me so hard that that later on we left about 20 minutes later i thought we had only stayed about five minutes mm -hmm. so i i told people i said i don't think i was hit with infrasound but it seemed to me almost like time had compressed a little for me i i really lost all track of of uh, of time when that happened so i did think about that you know what happened on on that trail there because on the way back i don't really even remember a lot of the drive back there's many times in your car when you look up and you're two miles down the road and you've just been thinking about things i don't remember what i was thinking about on the way back hmm. i do remember getting back to my campsite though but i just wondered uh, you know that that was the one of the few weird occurrences other than Bigfoot stuff that, that I've probably ever experienced. And and, uh, and I've been back to that same, some of you have been to that spot. I've been back to that same spot three or four times. Mm -hmm. I've been back there with a person before and never told the story or never told them because I wanted to see what it was like walking through there. I wanted to watch them, see if they felt anything or anything. But it was just a whole different time, whole different conditions and everything at that point. Wow. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Again, um, I've done a little bit of research on infrasound because um, we also kind of take that into consideration when we're doing paranormal investigating as well. Because uh, infrasound, um, whether it's man-made or natural, can have, uh, especially if it's man-made, can be really, it, it can wreak havoc on a human body. Um, you know, some uh, governments back in the 40s have tried to use it as, um, as weapons uh, because it's something you can't see. And um, you can have, you know, your ears and your eyes can be bleeding and you can just feel the tingling and you get, um, uh, you, you can see things from the corner of your eyes. It's just, it, it really, because infrasound is 20 hertz or below, and your eyes and ears resonated about there as well. So if there is infrasound around, then uh, the body really responds to it. So it's it's pretty fascinating, fascinating stuff to me anyways. So to, to hear that encounter, it sounded like it was infrasound now, whether it was Bigfoot or some other natural creature, um, or if it was uh, UFOs. <laughs> I don't know, but that was that was pretty interesting. Well, something that's interesting, and and I don't know why this story sticks with me so much. I think it's because of the age of the person <clears throat> and the circumstances. And my father, my father was a uh, he was a hunter, uh, and later on, even when he couldn't hunt, he would just kind of go and sit and listen to me turkey hunt, and would go with me. But. Uh, if anyone has Amazon Prime on that missing 411, uh, one of the first uh, stories on there is about a, a gentleman hunting with several people. I, I think you know the one I'm talking about. Uh, but one of the things that struck me about that story was a person that was hunting with him in the line of people. And he kind of very quickly made the statement of well i heard 
I, well, I heard something. I'm not sure what it was. Mm-hmm. Later on, you'll see if you watch that, uh, he explains or somebody that he explained it to stated that it sounded like a large metallic object up in the woods, like a steel trap slamming shut really? was the exact terminology. So that 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 kind of stuck with me, and even a few weeks ago, somebody asked me about this down in a, a county in Alabama where some people I've been going down there and visiting them where they have lots of Bigfoot activity for generations. They they have stories and stories of things going on down there, but we were off in those woods behind there and heard. A strange metallic noise off in the woods and I looked at him and said what's in there what you know what's I just said what's back there he goes nothing <laughs> that's all he said uh, but even when I recorded that one of the guys in my group said you know what, what do you mean by metallic I said it wasn't a natural sound this was a this I hate to say this all the time but I tell people if you had been there the sound that you heard is somewhere within the Rolodex of your mind of sounds that's in there. You would have recognized the sound and known that it wasn't something that was supposed to be there. And that's what that really was uh, on that trail today. I kind of felt like I, I didn't feel like I didn't belong there, but I felt like I don't know. I don't know what happens after that. So when I watch those missing one, four one one uh, shows, I really do sit back and think, you know, where are they? Hmm. You know, where's that person at? I mean, hmm. I'm going to know one day. One day I'll know where they're at. But where are they now? Mm-hmm. You know. So that's what that's what kind of uh, I wasn't really even big into the four one one stuff till till after that happened. I've never watched so it. I've, 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 of course, heard of it, but I've never watched it. But now I'm going to. If you simply watch anybody that, even if you're, oh, goodness gracious, even if you're just a, a camper or go occasionally hiking, uh, you know, those are, are on Prime for free and they're, they're super interesting. And gosh, I just watch them over and over because my mind just, you know, wants to know, just like everybody else wants to know. Have you found any similarities watching that show from what you encountered to what people have witnessed? When, when you watch that show, uh, David Politis mm-hmm. is the, the gentleman who did it. He's an ex-police officer. He re- and he originally is a Bigfoot person. Uh, and you will notice that he, uh, he will never come out and say that the things are Bigfoot related as, as well he shouldn't uh, because we really don't know mm-hmm. but he does give a very specific list of profile points that people uh, meet and so <laughs> after my thing happened I mean now this is not like going on the internet and looking up symptoms for you know because you can give yourself symptoms for all kinds <laughs> of stuff yeah. I'm I'm a realist, and uh, and I did, and I went down through the checkpoints that he had, and there were several things there. There was a weather event right before I went, and there was a weather event right as I was leaving. And that's normally one of the key things is after a person goes missing, there's some type of a weather event to hinder their, the search or something like that. And then there's lots of other things such as, uh, uh, you know, the age group, uh, sometimes the people that go missing have some type of maybe an injury or maybe even something that they haven't been diagnosed with yet some type Mm -hmm. of a terminal something and i've got all kinds of you know injuries some days i just hobble around (laughs) a lot uh a lot of usually missing at midday late afternoon Mm -hmm. a lot of times they have a dog with them i always find that odd wow you know that's interesting Yes, they always have a, a lot of times they have a dog with them. And a lot of times a dog is found. Sometimes a dog's not found and the person's not found. But there's a there's a, a pretty stringent 
you know, list of profile points. Otherwise, gosh, there's, there's so many missing people. But how many people are, are walking down a trail in a line of seven or eight, and one of them steps into the woods and you never ever see them again? No. <laughs> so, because that, that really is some of the circumstances that I've read about there. So I think about stuff like that too. Because that co- that covers me, you know. You that, just metal- miss, you know? that metallic sound really um, intrigues me. I'm going to have to dig further into that. It really, if you watch that, you'll hear one of the 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 men that was was uh, the guy's name is Tom Messick. I think is what his name is. Uh, the person that was hunting with him. Uh, one of the guys that's still alive because they were all older guys Mm -hmm. but i found that interesting too because if you've been in the woods you really things that are not natural catch your attention way before something that's natural yep i mean most people like me that are in the woods we really hear a lot of the natural stuff as ambient noise anyway because we're so used to it Mm -hmm. it's really something like that that catches your attention like the smacking of a a plastic barrel on the bottom of the LBL or mm-hmm. you know something like that that's but when that happened honestly I thought I wonder if there's some guys maybe got them a, a moonshine steel up in there somewhere but the next day I went up went barrel hunting of course up in there and couldn't find anything before I left hmm. but yeah those are just some the very strangeties that happen uh, but I'm not so it it doesn't really push the parameters of my speculation to say that there's probably things out there that that really mimic unnatural noises very well Mm -hmm. and i and it i've heard a person speak about the fact of them being off in the the woods eight nine fifteen miles and you know hearing a car door slam which is impossible things like that mm-hmm. you know you cover lots of things on your show that, that, that we don't cover on our show so <laughs> that, the, the possibilities is exciting to me it is i uh now i have some research to do <laughs> i'm gonna watch that four on one this weekend aren't i'm you? gonna be binging it <laughs> <laughs> and i have yeah, amazon prime <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you sharing everything and especially that story that you'd never shared with anyone before. I'm so honored that you decided to share it with myself and the listeners. Thank you so much. I appreciate everyone listening. I tried to move quickly because I wanted to cover a little bit, cover a lot quickly because, you know, me and Chad have been trying to do this for you asked me last year yeah you know this is when we've had the first chance so i just wanted to try to cover everything quickly and i hope i've been worth everybody's time and uh and yes i had a really great time i really appreciate you asking me to be on thank you oh just lost my my voice there for a sec thank you so very much again uh hang on tight for a sec and uh as i say good evening to the listeners And everybody take care of yourself and and each other. Until next time. Well, we've made it to the end of another episode. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, take care of each other. And if you'd like to be on the show or have questions and comments, just drop me an email, paranormalheart13 at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. Paranormal Heart would like to extend a special thank you to PurplePlanet.com for supplying the music for the show. The views and opinions expressed on Paranormal Heart are those of the host and participants. 